Good evening. My name is Caleb Aradano, and on behalf of the McConnell Center at the University of Louisville and all those partnering with us in this series, I thank you for joining virtually. Tonight, we continue our year-long series we're calling Variety Left and Right, where we seek to enhance our civil discourse by encouraging engagement with a wide variety of political views and perspectives. In this series, we seek understanding of one another, not conformity with any political or social views. We trust that you will engage with us in that same spirit. Today, we are pleased to have back with us Dr. Mark David Hall. Dr. Hall has been to the McConnell Center several times and has been a student favorite and even co-edited co one of our books, America's Forgotten Founders. Dr. Hall is the Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics at George Fox University, but is on leave this year being a fellow at Princeton University's James Madison program. He's the author or editor of more than 10 books on the American founding. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark David Hall to discuss Christian nationalism. Well, thank you very much, Caleb, and thanks to Gary Gregg and the McConnell Center. It's always a pleasure, a, a true pleasure being out this way. I apologize that I'm standing between you and dinner. That was not my plan. Hopefully we had snacks to hold us over. I will try to go about 50 minutes, and then apparently the plan is for you to go out that door, go around there, get some food, come back in here, and then we'll have a time of discussion. Um, so questions and answers, objections, or just outright discussion. So I really am looking for feedback. I, I'm relatively new um, as one who studied this phenomenon of Christian nationalism. How and why did I become interested in that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. On January 6, 2021, I was flying home from a speaking engagement. And I received, when I landed in Dallas for a layover, I received a, a note from a reporter. And the reporter said, Dr. Hall, can you comment on the Christian symbols among the rioters at Capitol Hill? I said, oh my goodness, I didn't even hear the riot. I've been in the plane. I'm always too cheap to, to, to pay for Wi-Fi. So I didn't know anything that was going on. And so I, I had a few, I had about 20 minutes and I, I reviewed the footage. And I saw a sea of MAGA hats, a sea of American flags, a sea of Trump flags, and no Christian images. And I'm a pretty lifelong um, Christian, and I know what Christian images look like. Well, where are they? Well, eventually I received five images from the reporter, and I have them for you here now. Um, here you have this big wooden cross, and you can't really see it, but the woman in that um, picture there is holding a, a, a little sign that says, like, God patriotism and glory, or something like that, right? But God is there. Now, if you remember your geography of Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument is 1.5 miles from the U.S. Capitol building. And I'm told this, um, where the cross is at this point, is, is, is similarly far away. All right? So these are not images among the rioters at the Capitol Hill riot. Well, then we have a couple of other images. These are the images, the literal images sent to me by the reporter, right? We have the Pine State flag, an appeal to heaven. Well, that certainly sounds kind of religious, doesn't it? And indeed, it could come from Judges 11, but guess what? It could also come from John Locke's Second Treatise on Government. And this is a revolutionary era flag. So maybe whoever brought it just thought, okay, we're kind of doing a revolution today. I'll bring a revolutionary era flag. Same with the Don't Tread on Me flag, both from the revolutionary era. Now, as I said, I've been going to church since I was you know, a baby, right? I've spent a lot of time in church. A time in evangelical churches, I have never, ever, literally in my life seen someone like that in one of the churches I've, attend, uh, I've attended. But this is like the most obvious Christian symbol. We have this goth-type guy with the skeletal hands holding the Bible, an image of the Bible. And he is, in fact, close to the rioters. And so I cautioned the reporter. I said, uh, look, reporter, you might want to be careful with this narrative that you seem to be crafting that Christian nationalists have attacked the U.S. Capitol building. Now, there may be other evidence, but what you sent me is really not strong evidence to support this thesis. And uh, again, if you go through all the footage like me, you'll see a sea of all sorts of symbols um, that not particularly too many Christian symbols. So I gave this caution to the reporter. The next day, her story came out, Christian nationals have attacked the U.S. Capitol building. And she had three images, not these images, but three other images, none of which were from the Capitol Hill riot. And let me be crystal clear, that sort of rioting must be condemned. The rioters should be um, prosecuted to the full extent of the law, so I'm not offering any defense of that action. I'm just saying the explanation that it's Christian nationalism that is causing this attack um, needs to be questioned. 
If you look at stories on January 7th, you will see a bazillion stories like this. Christian nationals have attacked the U.S. Capitol building. And the reporters aren't just making it up. They're going to some uh, authors who've written books on Christian nationalism, and they're saying things like, that attack was as Christian nationalist as it gets. All right, so we can give the reporters a little slack. Although I have to say, the reporter I cautioned against uh, didn't mention my caution. She didn't mention me, and she just ran with her narrative. And this kind of got me to thinking. So um, Caleb didn't give a lot of my biography. I've done a lot of work on religion in America, religion, the American founding, religious liberty, church-state relations. Uh, but on all honesty, I hadn't read much about contemporary Christian nationalism per se. And so this kind of got my wheels turning. Well, what's going on here? Let me do concede that additional evidence has come to light. Uh, 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 just maybe over a year ago, two organizations, the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Freedom and the Freedom From Religion Foundation, people came out with the report. Now, you might be thinking, Baptist, all those conservative Southern Baptists. No, 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 not that kind of Baptist. This is an organization dedicated to the strict separation of church and state, as is the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Okay, so these are the sort of people who truly think religion should be uh, scrubbed from the public square. The Baptist Joint Committee came out against a 1925 memorial cross on public land, saying it's unconstitutional, this cannot be allowed. The Supreme Court disagreed seven to two. So um, even two, what we usually think of as progressive justice, Stephen Breyer and, Breyer and Lega Kagan agreed that the cross did not have to go. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, when Ohio was coming out with a Holocaust memorial and wanted to include the Star of David in the Holocaust memorial, the, um, there it is, the Freedom From Religion Foundation said, well, we aren't against a Holocaust memorial, but you can't have the Star of David. That's a religious symbol, and religion cannot be allowed in the public square. So I just wanted to give you a sense of where these organizations are coming from. This will become relevant a little bit later. Now, they did find, you've probably seen, and it's been everywhere, there was indeed a Christian flag. Some of you probably worship at churches that have a Christian flag, right? That white flag, with the little blue in the corner, the red cross. It was there, but guess what? So was the Confederate flag. By my count, there were exactly as many Christian flags as there were Confederate flags, and yet that does not keep Andrew Seidel from saying Christian flags were everywhere. So people are just making things up, it seems to me. And yes, someone said a prayer in the Capitol, and there was crazy goth guy. It was just a whole mess. So I'm not denying that there were not some Christian symbols at the Capitol Hill riot, but I want to say there's a whole heck of a lot of symbols and a whole lot of different motivations for people behind that, and I think we need to be careful with this Christian nationalist rhetoric. So you might say, well, what the heck is Christian nationalism? Let me give you, uh, first of all, let me divide the literature. I divide the literature into the polemical literature on Christian nationalism. So books written by people like Andrew Seidel from the Freedom From Religion Foundation and now vice president of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. He actually says in his book, Attacking Christian Nationalism, he says, this is not an academic project. This is an attack. It's a polemic. All right. He's a JD, but he's no scholar. He's not trying to be objective. He's going on the attack. Other people who've written this polemical literature, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean here, are journalists and activists of a very, uh, variety of stripes. There are a few academics who have weighed into this debate, probably most famously Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. And so I'm going to give you their definition of Christian nationalism. So these are two university professors who published a book with Oxford University Press. According to them, Christian nationalism, and I'm quoting here, is an idea, ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of American civic life with a particular type of identity and culture that includes assumptions of nativism, white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, along with divine sanctions for authoritarian control and militarism. It is as ethnic as it is political and religious. Understood in this light, Christian nationalism contends in America has been and always should be a distinctively Christian from the top to the bottom in its self-identity, interpretations, its own history, sacred symbols, church values, public policies, and it aims to keep it that way. So that, that's, those are a lot of words, but I hope you get the flavor, right? Um, Christian nationalists are, are, are mean-spirited theocrats who want to take over America for Christ and oppress everyone except for white male Christians. Now, that's scary. 
I would be terrified if um, a movement like this existed and had much following. And I'm certainly not denying that there are racist jerks out there who are militarists and so forth and so on. But are 51.9% of Americans fully or partially supportive of this ideology described by Whitehead and Perry? They claim there are. They claim that they can measure and count 51.9% of Americans embrace fully or partially this ideology. I want to suggest there are excellent reasons to question those conclusions. And yet, um, first, let's talk about some, some of the political literature. So here are some of, the, some of the literature. I'm talking about Andrew Seidel over there, Michelle um, <clears throat> Goldberg, Julie Ingersoll, uh, Catherine Stewart, and others. Now, this literature is um, it, it's, it's highly polemical. It is, relies far more on rhetoric and assertion than it does evidence. So for instance, Catherine Stewart, I'm sorry, Michelle Goldberg in her book, Kingdom Coming, The Rise of Christian Nationalism, argues that the ultimate goal of Christian nationalist leaders is fairness, it's dominion. The movement is based on a theology that asserts the Christian right to rule. This early literature talked about Christians in general wanting to rule. It has since evolved to be white Christians, and especially white male Christians, right? And so these are the, the real culprits. Now, there are plenty of people who support this who aren't white male Christians, but that's ultimately the end of this ideology, according to the critics. Anita Butler explains that um, white evangelicals are part of a nationalistic political movement who perp whose purpose is to support the hegemony of white Christian men over and, again the over and against the flourishing of others. So white Christian men don't want any of you women here, any of you racial minorities here, any of you non-Christians here to flourish, right? We're going to push you down, keep you down, and that's our goal in life. Um, Andrew Seidel, again, um, the Christian nationalists seek to codify Christian privilege in the law, favoring Christians above others and disfavoring non-religious, non-Christians and minorities. So these, um, again, I can give you plenty of examples. I, I have an essay that was published with the Standing for Freedom Center called Tilting at Windmills. It gives lots and lots of examples of this. And you can either Google it or if you can't find it, send me an email and I will send it to you. Again, it, it's almost all rhetoric, right? Assertions that, you know, there, there's this horrible movement afoot. You should be afraid. You should be very, 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 very afraid because they're extremists, right? You know, this sort of thing time and time again. Now, there are some factual claims and I'm going to just look at one of them to give you a sense as to how absurd they are. And let me just give you a hint, those of you who are students. If you are making factual claims, you should support them. And if you can't support them, you ought not to make them. My favorite factual claim among the um, critics of Christian nationalism, all the polemical critics and even some of the academic critics, point to Rusas John Rushduni. I'm going to ask you a question, and don't think I'm trying to embarrass you, because if you haven't heard of this guy, um, all that says about you is that you're not an idiosyncratic Calvinist. How many people have heard of this theologian? He is an obscure, idiosyncratic Calvinist thinker, and I say this is somewhat of a Calvinist myself, so that's not a critique, it's just an accurate description. So Rush Dooney lived from 1916 to 2001. He's a child of immigrants who fled the Armenian genocide, and he eventually became a Presbyterian minister and started, quote, a tiny little think tank with a modest budget and a few staff members. Now, he was influenced by some less obscure Calvinist thinkers, Abraham Kuyper, Cornelius Van Til, who articulated this version of neo-Calvinism that says basically Jesus Christ is Lord of all of creation, and what Christians need to do is they need to think through the implications of their faith for every part of life, how they raise children, how they run businesses, and yes, politics and law. And so he takes this insight and he runs with it. And that's not particularly pernicious in and of itself. A number of Calvinists have done this over time. Now, it is interesting as a father of Christian nationalists and to point out that Rushduni actually had almost no interest in the United States of America. He said that basically the purpose of the Constitution was to create a confederation of states. And ultimately, what would happen as society became more and more Christianized is power would devolve to the county level, to the local level. And so really what he's talking about is very localist, political institutions, laws, and that sort of thing, right? So no interest in the United States as a nation per se. So, so to call him a nationalist is problematic, as um, nationalism is oftentimes used. But, and the, here we get to why. Why Rush Dooney? 
in thinking through the implications, his view of the implications of what a Christian society would look like, he makes a move that almost no other Christian thinker makes. And I'm not saying it's an illegitimate move, I'm just saying when you think of all Christian thinkers, Orthodox, large Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic, they all go one way, Rush Dooney goes the other. And he says, you know those, those civil laws of the Old Testament that almost no Christian thinks are normative today? They will become normative again. And so the Christian society will punish adultery by death. The Christian society will punish homosexual activity by men, by death. Not by women, but by men. Um, the Christian society will punish incorrigible juvenile delinquency with death. And of course, murder and rape and this sort of thing as well, right? And so he lays out all these things that will be punishable by death. And as well, I think it's fair to say he absolutely believes of male headship within the family, male headship within the, within the church. He is often accused of being a racist. I think these criticisms are unfair. But he says things that are imprudent. For instance, to give you one example, he says some forms of, of slavery may be permissible within the Christian society. Now, all of a sudden, you know, alarm bells are going off, right? But he goes on to say clearly the race-based chattel slavery that existed in America is unbiblical. It's unacceptable. All right, so anyway, why Rush Dooney? Think about it. This is like the embodiment of this evil form of Christian nationalism, mean-spirited, violent, patriarchal at least, maybe racist, and it's terrifying, right? Who would want to live in a society where incorrigible juvenile delinquents could be put to death? So this is a, a scary giant um, that, 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 that people like Andrew Seidel and Catherine Stewart, Julian Gersall want to attack and say, look, this is what these Christian nationalists are. Keep in mind, 51.9% of American fully or supportive, partially supportive of this sort of stuff. That is a scary thought. Now, there's a problem with this, as we've already seen. I think my friend John Wilsey didn't raise his hand. He's probably heard of Rush Dooney. I know he has. Um, but none of the rest of you had, and you're highly educated people, right? Nobody knows of Rush Dooney unless you're a part of a kind of idiosyncratic strain of Calvinism. And I say that again, not to be critical, just to be accurate and descriptive. There are Calvinists who like Rush Dooney. Absolutely. I've met them. They're very nice guys. There's actually a student at Princeton I met who loves Rush Dooney. So they exist. They're out there, but they're very, very rare. So how do you become, how, how do you get people uptight about this? Well, you make claims. Well, maybe people don't know Rush Dooney, but Rush Dooney influenced people. So for instance, in the 2010 elections, according to um, Julie Ingersoll, you could see Reconstruction influence everywhere, everywhere. Reconstruction, the, basically the doctrine of Rush Dooney, also known as theonomy. Now, you are nodding your head very nicely. If you're going to make a claim like that, you've got to give evidence. What's the evidence, Ms. Ingersoll? Well, Rand Paul. He's influenced by Rush Dooney. And this person named um, Sharon Angle. Now, I understand some of you are probably to the left of Rand Paul, but when's the last time you heard Rand Paul call for putting incurvenal, incurvenal juvenile delinquents to death, or adulterers to death, or witches to death? This does not sound like the Rand Paul I know, right? Sharon Angle, on the other hand, never claimed, and none of these people ever claimed to be followers of Rush Dooney or claimed to be re Reconstructionists, um, but Harry Reid, the opponent, at Angle, um, Tartar's one. He put out a 27-page manifesto saying, look at this woman, you should be very, very scared of her. She's a, a, a Reconstructionist. She wants to put in cultural delinquents to death, right? So let's say for the sake of argument, and I almost don't even want to say that, but let's say for the sake of argument, those two are influenced by Rush Dooney. That's two out of something like 460 um, people, probably double that, right? If you have both Democrats and Republicans. So two out of what? 900 people competing for Congress who you're pointing to and saying they're a Reconstructionist. And yet, again, you guys know Rand Paul tolerably well, right? Does he seem like a follower of Rush Dooney? I think those claims are highly, highly debatable. So, in other words, if I was a paper, a, a, a teacher grading this paper, I would say, where is your evidence? Pointing to two people who you just simply assert are, are, are influenced by Rush Dooney is not a very good argument. A reporter from the Washington Post said exactly the same thing. Um, she writes, in fact, in response to this claim, the Christian Reconstructionist movement was small and mostly ignored. This is a reporter from the Washington Post. 
The group's founder, R.J. Rastuni, tried to start a political party, but it went nowhere. When Rastuni died nine years ago, the movement dried up. Now, that's largely right. She actually was inaccurate. Rastuni himself did not try to found a political party, but he did have a follower, Howard Phillips, who did. Howard Phillips is one of the architects of the religious right. And so there you go. There's some influence. And yet Howard Phillips in 1992 got fed up with the Republican Party, said the Republican Party's not doing what I want, so I'm going to go off and form a new party, a party that embraces the ideals of Rush Dooney, the Constitution Party. In the last election, the Constitution Party got like 0.02% of the vote. So there are people out there who are maybe sympathetic to some of this, but again, it's a tiny, tiny fraction, certainly not the Republican Party real large. All right, and again, this is an influence. Again, I concede, Rush Dooney had some influence. This guy, Howard Phillips, liked him. Francis Schaefer of Labrie was intrigued with, um, with, with Rush Dooney. He used his books at, at Labrie, and yet Rush Dooney repeatedly wanted to meet with Schaefer. Schaefer always declined to do so. According to Schaefer's son, Schaefer thought that Rush Dooney was clinically insane. Other people who are claimed to have been influenced include the usual suspects, D. D. James Kennedy, Pat Robertson, and David Barton. It's, there's no doubt that some of these folks did in fact read um, Rush Dooney, Schaefer did. The, 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 the evidence that the others did is highly, highly dubious. Take David Barton, the popular Christian historian. Um, Julie Ingersoll has an entire chapter, David Barton and the Tea Party. It's suggesting that, um, that Rush Dooney had important influence on Barton. The, um, let's see, oh yeah, I have some good, oh, I left out some of these facts. It's kind of fun. Um, she, she, she makes factual claims against problematic factual claims that, um, she, that David Barton occasionally cites a work of Rush Dooney. That's pretty weak sauce, but in fact, I, I, I cannot find anywhere where Barton cites Rush Dooney even once. It's not clear to me that Ingersoll reached out to David Barton. I did. I sent him an email. I said, hey, what do you think about this uh, Rusa Shostuni guy? He responded to me, I know the name, but I don't even know what his works are. I've never read him. And similar arguments are made with other people like Stephen McDowell and others, and we could run through that if we had more time. Let me just, again, let me just suggest there are, are, are factual claims that are easily falsifiable that I falsify. I can show, look, there's no evidence of this. And th th there's just rhetoric without evidence among the polemical authors on Christian nationalism. All right, well, let's shift gears and go to two serious sociologists who I think, I, I would like to think, are making a good faith effort to define and measure Christian nationalism. Whitehead and Perry, I already gave their definition of Christian nationalism. Again, a horrible, toxic mix of the theocrats that want to take over America for Christ and oppress everyone, basically, except for white Christian males, maybe white Protestant males. Well, how do you go about measuring if you're a Christian nationalist or not. There's their book right there. Um, they use a series of questions, and what you get to do as, not really questions, as statements, what you get to do if you're taking this survey, which was actually done by Baylor, they didn't come up with it, 2010 to 2017, these um, statements were sent out, and you get to respond to them, right? So you look at this, the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation. If you say, I strongly disagree, that's zero points. If you say, I strongly agree, that's four points, and then you could fall in between, right? I actually think this is not a bad question. I think this question gets at something that can be called Christian nationalism. The federal government should advocate Christian values. Well, right away, all these questions, incidentally, I can understand how you could read them in such a way as to privilege Christianity above all other faiths, but I think they can also take a very different view. I would say to question number two, and I speak as a follower of Christ, absolutely the federal government should embrace Christian values, should advocate Christian values. Peace, justice, liberty, um, freedom. These are Christian values. You know, they're not uniquely Christian values. People of other faiths hold them. People of no faith at all hold them. But at least they're values I hold dear because of my Christian faith. So absolutely you should do that. And that in no way privileges Christianity or white males above all others. In fact, in, in, in many cases throughout American history, the opposite, right? Getting rid of laws that are oppressing racial minorities and so forth. Three of these questions then get at the strict separation 
of church and state. The um, strict separation of church and state has been used by people like Andrew Seidel and Amanda Taylor of the Baptist Joint Committee to say things like a World War I era cross must be tore down, right? The federal government should allow the display of religious symbols in public spaces. Well, if you strongly disagree with that, what are you going to do? Tear down this World War I era cross? Tear down the Star of David in the Ohio Holocaust Memorial? Um, should Native Americans be permitted to use peyote when states like Oregon have laws prohibiting some, them from doing so? Advocates of the strict separation of church and state say no religious accommodation. That violates this wall of separation. I say absolutely religious accommodations, right? We need to protect the ability of Native Americans to worship God according to the dictates of conscience. In some cases, people just aren't reading these questions carefully. A guy named Paul Miller has a book on this question. He says, number six, gets that teacher-led prayer in public school. Again, if he was my student, he would get dinged. No, that's not what it says. The federal government should allow prayer in public school. So a group of Muslim students want to meet and pray at the appropriate time of the day in a public school. Should they be permitted to do so? Absolutely. Absolutely they should. A group of Protestants wants to meet during lunch hour and pray for their math test. Should they be allowed to do so? Absolutely. In fact, to say the federal government should not allow prayer in public school is, is profoundly illiberal, right? To say that we're going to prohibit a voluntary prayer in public school. And I say this as someone who's completely against teacher-led prayer in public school. So I want to make that distinction. I'm focusing on prayer should be allowed, not required, not even led by teachers. Um, absolutely it should. And so in the final analysis, I think really all of these questions fundamentally get at the separation of church and state or other things. Oh yeah, my favorite, speaking of Calvinism, the success of the United States is part of God's plan. I've already put my cards on the table. I'm somewhat of a Calvinist. I say yes. We can turn around and say, what about the failures of the United States? Is that part of God's plan? Yes, it is. Replace the United States with Holland. Is the success of Holland part of God's plan? Yes, you know Calvinists, right? Predestination and the whole nine yards. Now, you might disagree with that theologically, and that's perfectly fine, but one could easily answer yes to that without being any sort of mean-spirited Christian nationalist. All right, so I, I find these measures to be highly problematic. I do not think that Whitehead and Perry went out purposely to destroy, distort their study, but their implicit biases show through. Let me give you two examples. First of all, we learn from Whitehead and Perry, they state this twice, that if you are pro-life, you are simply concerned with controlling women's bodies. Let me emphasize that. If you are pro-life, you are simply concerned with controlling women's bodies. And that certainly sounds patriarchal, right? Or sexist. Now, one problem with this is women are just as likely to be fully pro-life as men. And so one needs to ask, what are these women concerned with? Are these women really concerned with controlling other women's bodies? It strikes me, you could be the most pro-choice person in this room and understand that pro-life people think that there's an unborn baby involved and they're concerned with protecting human life. You might disagree with that position, but at least one could hopefully recognize that pro-lifers aren't just about controlling other people, they're trying to protect human life as they understand it. Or if you believe freedom of worship, mean, that religious liberty means more than freedom of worship, you're a bigot. Well, this is highly problematic. After all, the First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The First Amendment has always meant more than the freedom of worship. The, the liberal justice, William Brennan, came up with a wonderful test in 1963 to make it crystal clear that our ability to act upon our religious convictions must be protected whenever possible. Not always. We aren't going to permit human sacrifice or beating children in the name of religion. Obviously, there's limits. But whenever possible, one's ability to act upon one's faith should be protected. The ability of Native Americans to use peyote and religious ceremonies that are centuries old, that should be protected, if at all possible. All right, so the argument then is not that they are, are, are polemicists, that they set out to destroy, distort the record, but I think their, their implicit biases have led them to do so. And we should be highly skeptical of the view that 51.9% of Americans fully or partially embrace Christian nationalism. One kind of embarrassing finding for them is that 65% of African Americans are fully or partially support of Christian nationalism. And if we recall their definition that involves racism and all this, that's kind of problematic one might say. 
All right, so between 2006 and 2022, it's only critics who are writing about Christian nationalism. But no one prior to 2022 said, I am a Christian nationalist. Let's advocate for Christian nationalism. That's not literally true. You can find a person here or there, but almost completely literally, no one is doing it, right? And so, of course, when something has been so disparaged for so long, in 2022, Christians, some Christians, a handful of Christians come out and say, oh, what a great idea. Why don't we call ourselves Christian nationalists? Marjorie Taylor Greene, a representative from Georgia, comes out and embraces the idea. Doug Wilson, an idiosyncratic Calvinist pastor from Moscow, Idaho, has done the same. Um, we've seen two books published for the first time advocating for Christian nationalism. To call the, um, the, the first one a book is really being far too generous. It's a self-published screed. It's a pamphlet, and I won't spend much time on it. The second one, though, Stephen Wolf is a Ph.D. in political science, and it's a very substantial tome arguing for Christian nationalism today. And I'll just jump to that, so I'm going to skip over the first book. We can go back and talk about it if you want. Um, the Stephen Wolf begins with a premise. Now, I had a teacher in college who said, if you grant Thomas Hobbes his premises, um, you're lost, right? You're forced to grant him the conclusions. I think the same is true with Stephen Wolf. Stephen Wolf basically says 16th and 17th century Calvinist political thinkers arrived at the truth. Now, if you agree with that statement, then you're pretty much stuck with his conclusions that we should have a Christian prince that can do things like call synods, judge the, um, the results of tenant synods, that is a church council sort of thing, that the Christian prince should punish heresy, maybe putting heretics to death, that the Christian prince should punish um, the errant or lazy pastor. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. And I think he's really talking about literally a prince, one person, not a representative body or that sort of thing. How many of you all think it's a good idea to have your local elected officials run roughshod over the local ministers to say, oh, that's a lazy minister. Let's punish him. Oh, that's true doctrine. That's false doctrine. Seems to me to be just a horrible idea. Now, in the 16th and 17th century, political civil rulers did this all the time. So he's more or less right. This is what these folks have embraced. However, in America, praise the Lord, um, we came of age in the 18th century, and America's founders, 50 to 75 percent of whom were Calvinists, um, came up with a very different idea. We're not going to have religious tests for office. We're going to have a widespread understanding of religious liberty. When the Presbyterians um, altered, when they revised the Westminster Confession of Faith, the original Westminster Confession of Faith made it crystal clear that civic rulers could call church synods. The Americans in 1787, 1788 said, no way, the government has no business calling synods and so forth and so on. So we went in a very different direction, a direction that I think incidentally has been very good for the church. Whenever governments run churches, this is always bad for the church. Americans went in a very different direction, and I'm very grateful they did so. So these books, um, again, I, I kind of appreciate Stephen Wolf's attempt. It's a serious, intellectually serious enterprise. Many of the conclusions, I, I think, are just flat out wrong. And it's fair to say, although both of these folks, again, interestingly enough, neither of them are nationalists. Um, Stephen Wolf says the United States of America is a lost cause. The best we can hope for is maybe a governor could stand up and interpose himself between the state and the national government. Does this sound familiar? We went through this in the 1860s. Um, we could rebel against the national government and create local communities. Does that sound familiar? Local communities that could then be these little Christian enterprises. So even though the image on, on, on his book makes it seem as if he's talking about the United States of America, if you actually read the book, he clearly is not. And again, he takes some very, 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 I want to say idiosyncratic. I suppose they weren't in the 16th and 17th century. For instance, he argues that the fundamental unit of society is a family. The husband is the head of the family. And therefore, for the purposes of representation, only the husband should vote. The married woman should not vote. Unmarried women, it's a matter of prudence. Maybe you'll be allowed to vote. Maybe you won't. Um, they go out of their way. I think it's fair to say I want to give them their due. They go out of their way to say this has nothing to do with the United States of America. It's a special country chosen by God that you could take their teachings and apply it in Holland or England or so forth. So none of these folks are claiming, none of these folks are claiming America is somehow specially chosen by God. They go out of their way. There's a little bit of ambiguity in the wolf, but I take him at his word that he's not um, talking about the privileging of one race over the other. Um, I think it's fair to say they are patriarchal or even sexist, uh, but they're far, they, even these works are a far cry 
from Whitehead and Perry in what they call Christian nationalism. What these advocates all do, in one degree or another, is they say, we are going to take this idea that has been tarred and reclaim it, all right? I think it's just dumb. Frankly, it's dumb. And I'll give you my favorite example. Prior to World War II, the fasces was a very common symbol. Have you seen this before on the mercury dime? The bundle of rods wrapped together with, a, with an ax here. It's a symbol of law and authority that goes back to Rome. Um, on the Washington Monument, you can see that Abe Lincoln has his hands. You can find these all over Washington, D.C. The fasces. it's a wonderful, good symbol. If a political party today were to say, we're going to reset take this and make it our symbol, I would say that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Fascists, fascism, Mussolini, Hitler, Tojo ruined this for all of us, right? Maybe it was a good symbol. It wasn't necessarily racist, um, but uh, since Hitler, it has become racist, but since Mussolini, and it would just be foolish. We can recognize maybe at one time it was a good symbol, but it's just foolishness to try to redeem it or reclaim it. In the same way, maybe there's nothing necessarily evil about the words Christian nationalism, but given the connotations it contains, given the, the, the baggage it has from 2006 all the way to the current year, I think it's just imprudent at best, foolish at worst to try to try to reclaim it. Let me head towards the conclusion by actually saying what I think Christian nationalism is. So I think almost all the critics of Christian nationalism are off base. They're painting the picture of an evil giant they desire, desire to fight, an evil giant that has almost no, um, no existence in America. The, the, the advocates of Christian nationalism are arguing for something that's going to be of interest to maybe 12,000 Americans. A handful of idiosyncratic Calvinists, it's going to go nowhere, right? I, we need to critique it, I critique it, it's going nowhere. There is something that I think is fairly called Christian nationalism, and I'll give you my own definition of it. And then I'll suggest what we should think about it. Not that I'm trying to tell you what to think, but here's how I think about it, and I'd love to hear what you think about this. In the United States, Christian nationalism is best understood as a view that the country was founded as a Christian nation, and consequently, the, the, the federal government should protect and promote Christianity in special ways. Christian nationalists usually believe that other faiths should be tolerated, but that the national government does not need to treat all religions equally. All right, so that's my attempt to define Christian nationalism. You know it does not include a conflation of Christian nationalism and the strict separation of church and state. It doesn't engage or, or, or say you can't have religious symbols of any sort on public land. It's a much more limited claim. Basically, it comes down, I think, to favoring Christianity. So let's just run through these quickly. The United States Constitution was inspired by God, reflects God's vision for America. So I wrote an entire book, Did America Have a Christian Founding? I argue the answer is yes, and I argue that we need to understand this in ways in which Christianity has influenced America's founders. But was the Constitution inspired by God? I have no idea. Perhaps it was. How are we to know? I, I don't know my, the mind of God. I don't think anyone writing on this knows the mind of God. So I, I, I just don't see, think we can know that. About 18% of Americans think they can. The federal government should declare the U.S. a Christian nation. About 15% of people say this would be a good idea. Um, this would be very off-putting and imprudent to do, I think. Something like what, I have these numbers here. 36% um, of Americans don't consider themselves to be Christian. So this would be very uh, off-putting to them, right? If this were to happen, public schools, teachers, should be allowed to lead students in Christian prayers. Note this question is significantly different than the last one we saw. Public school teachers should be um, allowed to lead students in Christian prayers, distinctly Christian prayers. About 30% of the people say yes. So roughly about 21%, if we average all these, are what I think are reasonably called Christian nationalists in America. Let me point out a couple of things. First of all, this is not the horrible toxic stew that Whitehead and Perry call Christian nationalism. It's relatively benign. What is the harm that is done if people believe the Constitution was inspired by God? Is there any implications for law and public policy if people hold that view? If there are, I have no idea what they are. The federal government should declare the U.S. a Christian nation. Again, I think this is a horrible idea. It's something that should not be done. But is it all that problematic? Right now, literally every constitution in the United States, bar the U.S. Constitution, 
makes a clear reference to the deity, and in the context of what, in which they were written, it clearly is a Christian God. Consider the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. Um, we, therefore, the people of Massachusetts, acknowledge with grateful hearts the goodness of the great legislature of the universe in affording us in the course of his providence an opportunity deliberately and peaceably, without fraud, violence, or surprise, of entering into the original, explicit, and solemn compact with each other and forming a new constitution of civil government for ourselves and prosperity and devoutly imploring his direction in so interesting a design. Do agree upon, ordain, and establish the following declaration of rights and the frame of government. All right, a clear reference to the deity. Every, literally every constitution has this sort of thing. What is the material harm that flows from this? Kentucky has that, right? How have people been harmed in Kentucky because of these constitutional provisions? Were Congress to declare the United States of America to be a Christian nation, and I do not think it should do that. Were it to decide it should do that, um, I'm not sure what the harm would be. Teachers leading students in Christian prayers is problematic. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you why all these things are bad ideas in a minute. But let me point out that, um, again, the exact harms are, are not crystal clear. The, the U.S. Supreme Court, for instance, there are Americans who object to saying the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, Jehovah's Witnesses, right? It used to be common, it still maybe is common, for many public schools to lead students in the Pledge of Allegiance. What the U.S. Supreme Court has said is you may do that, public schools, and private schools for that matter, but public schools, you may do this, but if a child has an objection to saying the Pledge of Allegiance, you can't force him or her to do so. Fair enough. In the unlikely event that the U.S. Supreme Court allowed states to return Christian prayers to the public school, almost certainly this sort of, sort of principle would apply, and little Jehovah's Witness kids or other kids that had objections to these prayers would be able to opt out of them. So again, all bad ideas, but none of which are existential threats to the United States of America as the advocates of Christian nationalism claim. Now, as soon as I've said that, let me give you two reasons why we should nonetheless reject even this benign form of Christian nationalism. I've already um, alluded to these. Uh-oh. That's, that's all right. That's basically the end of all the interesting slides. The um, two reasons. First of all, I've already alluded to this. I think the U.S. Constitution prohibits these things. America was founded on the principle of religious neutrality. Right Now, that can be taken in very bad ways. Let me tell you what I, what, what I mean by that. That means basically that we aren't going to have religious tests for office. This came up in the, in the debates over the ratification of the Constitution. The anti federalists said, oh my goodness, a Muslim, a Jew, or an atheist could hold office under Article 6 of the Constitution. And the Federalists had to say, yes, you're right. They can. And I think by extension, we could read the First Amendment as saying, look, the free exercise of religion and the establishment clause collectively prohibit the national government and later by extension the state governments from favoring one faith over the others. Okay, so that means it would be in constitutionally impermissible, I think, for a state to only erect Christian monuments, only erect crosses. But if a state like Ohio wants to have some monuments that are crosses, some that are stars of David, some that are all sorts of things under the sun, um, this is constitutionally permissible. You aren't favoring one faith above the other. So constitutionally, I think we can make a very good argument that all three of these things are unconstitutional. Sometimes, and I know some of you may not share my faith, and that's fine, sometimes I, I give talk before Christian audience, audiences, and I said, look, Christians have among the best reason for rejecting all these things. It's called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Would you like the United States to declare the, the nation an Islamic nation or a Hindu nation? If your answer to that is no, then you should understand why others don't want Congress to declare it to be a Christian nation. And I think the same logic applies to public schools as well. So I think both for biblical reasons and constitutional reasons and other prudential reasons, we have excellent reasons to reject even this most benign form of Christian nationalism. And with that, I will stop, and thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Hall, for joining us in Louisville for what has been a deeply engaging and introspective talk on Christian nationalism. And for all those joining online, thank you for participating, and be sure to be on the lookout for future public lectures put on by the McConnell Center. Thank you.